everyone. Um, well, as Sylvia said, the, the title is Data Ownership and Self-Sovereign Identity. Uh, and I hope to clear up some, some misconceptions of self-sovereign identity and show some practical use cases. So, okay, before I start, uh, just a little bit about me and, and my company. So, um, I'm from a distributed systems background. I worked in academic research for some years and then moved into cybersecurity. And now I combine the two as the CEO of Cryptonics and the lead auditor of Solidified, two companies that work on blockchain security. And I specialize in, um, in smart contract audits and full stack blockchain security. And as a company, what we do at Cryptonics is we, we try to, to make blockchain and cryptography secure. We focus on anything related to blockchain security and the other way around. Right. So, so one way around is to make uh, the distributed ledger application secure and the, the other way around is to, to enhance cyber security by using cryptography and distributed ledger and, and anything related. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Signo, which is um, a framework uh, for self-sovereign management solutions we, we are working on. Uh, it, it's not going to be a product presentation. I'm just going to use it as an example of some use cases we have in mind and, and some demos. Um, but but it's essentially a, an enterprise-focused set of services built on top of our self-sovereign identity solution, which, which is open source and, and I would like to talk about. So, so as I said, I want to clear up some misconceptions. There are quite a lot of misconceptions about self-sovereign identity around. I want to talk a little bit about standards, but not too much because some standards are essentially quite uh, heavy and, and quite cumbersome. Uh, I want to go into the practical ways of turning standards into something usable uh, fairly quickly and then show some, some real world use cases that, that, that we can actually start using right now. So, okay, let's talk about digital identity. So digital identity is, is a complicated subject and, and that's mainly for a reason which is summarized in this phrase here by Kim Cameron, who's one of the important people in the self-sovereign identity community. And it basically says the internet was built without a way to know who and what you are connecting to. So, so that's true, right? Um, when the internet was first invented, it started off as a sort of a military experiment and then quickly turned into an academic experiment. But, you know, in the beginning, we just connected different machines together and we didn't even think about the use cases we are using right now. And that means uh, things like authentication and, and, um, and identity are not built in to the internet protocols. And, and that's been a problem for a long time which we've been patching uh, along the way. Um, but one of the, the, the things Safe Sovereign Identities is trying to address is, is to solve this digital identity problem. And when, when, it, when we talk about identity management, there's this very basic diagram that keeps coming up and, and it's the identity triangle, right? And that, that applies to any form of identity, not just digital identity, right? So there's three roles. Um, there's someone or something that is identified, an identity, and there are issuers of credentials and verifier of credentials. And the verifier always trusts the issuer, right? So an example is this, uh, an issuer, like the government gives me a passport, and then a verifier, some other government or a bank or anyone who wants to know who I am uses this to verify my that credential, my passport. Uh, it doesn't have to be something as as high level. You know, a credential can be like a library card or, or a, a username and, and password, a login. It can be anything. Um, it can even be something that is not a document. It can be something like a statement. Right, this person is over eighteen and is allowed to buy alcohol or drive a car, for example. And um, that, that triangle is the same everywhere. It doesn't go away when we talk about self-sovereign identity. It's still, it's still uh, important to realize that there's a trust relationship between the verifier and the issuer. So 
to implement this in in like in a connected world in in the internet on the internet in, in a digital environment over the years uh, several ways have have emerged and the the early and, and most well-known uh, way of dealing with identities is just to have centralized identity management right so there's a company that usually issues a credential or and creates a, an identity for uh, a user right so that's your username and password on, on a server that has some obvious problems like we have to have many different identities for many different services on the internet and it means the company stores our passwords our data anything related to our identity and, and we have to trust that centralized um, source and because people realized that was a bit uh, difficult to deal with we, we we invented a different paradigm which is called the federated identity management where you have a, a separate identity provider so this is your typical sign-on with google right so you have uh, an identity provider that issues an identity and provides an authentication service usually uh, and then there's a company that trusts google to, to to authenticate you and you usually there's a some sort of cryptographic token involved that is passed along and there are protocols to deal with this but but essentially that the, you now have an identity that you can use for a number of services now that's a little bit better but now we have to so it's got some obvious advantages in, in that we you know we don't have to have a separate identity for uh, each service we use but we still need to trust the centralized provider and if that provider is compromised in terms of security or, or just disappears we, we have a problem on a number of services so it's also a disadvantage and the idea of decentralized identity management which is essentially what self-sovereign identity um, uses as an implementation is to replace this federated uh, or federated uh, identity provider with a distributed ledger a blockchain right so now now we've we've reduced the the so, sorry we've removed the source of um, uh, the centralized source of failure or, or, or security incident and, and we also move the data somewhere else right so i'll talk a little bit about where the data now is uh, later but but basically the the blockchain never stores this private information we need to identify ourselves with that, that's moved back to the user so the user is in full control of this at least in, in the definition of self-sovereign identity that that's the way it should be and i'll explain a bit later on how that really works but just to have a comparison here this is a diagram i, I stole somewhere uh, I, I haven't made this up uh, this is this is i copied this from somewhere uh, but but it's quite good so so it shows these three models and, and the technologies involved in the centralized case are things like username and passwords and we can do clever stuff like multi-factor authentication and single sign-ons but we still have the identity fragmented across many enterprises and all these enterprises are in control of all the data related to our identity and in the federated case uh, it's not much better. We have different set of technologies. We've got uh, things like zero auth or, or auth. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Open ID. Uh, there's less fragmentation of login credentials, but the data is still um, fragmented across enterprises. And, and essentially, we have a, a centralized place uh, that, which is a honeypot for cyber attacks. Really, it's it's really. Uh, an easy target well not an easy target but a popular target and, and in a decentralized uh, solution we, we use cryptography and we use this these uh, um, we use distributed ledger technology and uh, the idea is that identity can be portable across enterprises and, and all the data is not stored on this blockchain nor in a company's uh, servers it's stored in in the use on the user side right so in, in a private end users wallet now that comes with some problems as well of course the users have to keep control over their wallets and, and manage their keys but essentially it's a, it's an empowered user right so you have you're in charge of your identity data 
that, that doesn't mean you make up this identity data, right? So, so that's very different from credentials. And I'll talk about this in, in a minute. We still need some trust in a credential issuer. Um, but before we get to all that, um, I, I don't want to turn this into a, a, a seminar on the basics of blockchain because that's, I assume everyone on, on this call knows more or less what a blockchain is. But, but there are a lot of uh, misconceptions uh, and, and it's important to understand what a blockchain can provide us with in order to understand what self-sovereign identity can do and what it can't do. So a distributed ledger or blockchain, well, a blockchain is a type of distributed ledger implemented using a cryptographically linked list data structure. I don't want to say much about this. We, we know this, it runs on a, a replicated database, essentially on a peer-to-peer -peer network but it, it was invented to solve a certain problem and only that problem. Uh, and that problem is that we have a peer-to-peer -peer network which has to maintain a copy of some information in exactly the same order, a transaction history, and, and no one is in charge, right? So there are certain properties that we have to guarantee that all the copies of the ledger are exactly the same. There isn't a coordinator and anyone can participate. Uh, well, I put that in, in parentheses because it's not true in all cases. You have things like consortium blockchains and private or more restricted permission scenarios, but that's not the case. But basically, there's an immutable database that everyone shares. Uh, and, and importantly, not everyone might be honest. So this means we have a unique version of the history. We have a mathematical foundation that can replace trusted third parties. And that's our uh, federated identity provider, right? So an identity provider can be replaced, but it doesn't mean that we can replace the credential issuer. Uh, more on that in a minute. But we obviously solve the double spending problem. We all know that we have a, a, an audible immutable record and we can digitize assets. And assets can be anything, right? An asset can be an identity. So importantly, there are certain things a blockchain cannot do, which are very relevant to identity. So a blockchain cannot give extra privacy. We can build fairly private systems using blockchain technology, but the blockchain itself is not uh, private. Everything is public. And so we have to be careful what we stick on the blockchain. And just because cryptography is involved doesn't mean um, uh, it's it, it's private, right? It, it doesn't encrypt anything on the blockchain. And we don't actually add any security just by using a blockchain. Obviously, we're using a lot of cryptographic tools, uh, and if they're used correctly, we can implement secure applications. But a blockchain by itself is not more secure than a centralized um, uh, or public key infrastructure. It has got some interesting properties that can make it more secure, but it isn't by default, right? It's also not possible to easily interact with external data. Um, and the, the applications tend to be very slow, right? We cannot have good performance with a blockchain. Um, well, at least not compared to a centralized system. And that's very important when we look at what, what we stick on the blockchain in, in, in a self-sovereign identity solution. Uh, related to that, we cannot store large amounts of data uh, and perform, obviously complex operations. Very importantly, data written on a blockchain is not automatically true, right? Uh, that that's a, should be obvious, but it's a common misconception and, and even very well funded uh, blockchain uh, uh, projects tend to get this wrong, right? They, they advertise the blockchain as some sort of universal truth machine. And, you know, I can write right now onto the blockchain that the sky is green, and it will be there forever. Uh, and the only thing that is true is that I've claimed that uh, at a certain point in time, but but it doesn't make the fact true. And that's the important difference. And that's very important in self-sovereign identity. Um, just because it says on the blockchain I'm over 18 doesn't mean that I am, right? We still have to trust the issuer of that claim saying that I'm over 18. So this... Uh, identity triangle where we have a verifier of a credential or claim and, uh, and, and an issuer doesn't go away, right? This trust relationship is still there. 
that, that that's important to realize so the way identity can be represented on the blockchain is related to the concept of digital ownership which really underlies every single blockchain use case out there right uh, basically you have an asset uh, which can be something virtual uh, like uh, like bitcoin something that doesn't exist in in the off-chain world or it can be a tokenization of something that does exist it doesn't matter right but we, we take something and we represent it on the blockchain and that's really just a number right an identifier uh, usually in some sort of smart contract or, or a token but it's uh, essentially it's just a number on the blockchain and uh, someone holds a cryptographic key that controls this representation of the asset on the blockchain and the ownership of the private key of this cryptographic key um, models the ownership of the asset and that's how we that, that that's the basis of all blockchain applications now this asset can be something we, we usually uh, think of as an asset like like something tra tradable with of money uh, in the form of money or, or some, some value or it can be an identity right and that's how we present identity on the blockchain oops just a, just a number really so safe sovereign identity makes use of this and and it uses the built-in public key infrastructure of the blockchain and the identity proof is really the ownership of a private key so i hold a private key that controls uh, some representation of my identity on the blockchain and by proving something like signing a message with this private key i prove my identity or at least that i hold the key for a certain identity and um, each identity has some data attached and in true self-sovereign identity this data is stored in an identity wallet so that data consists in uh, private keys obviously that control the public keys which are usually stored on the blockchain and it can have some claims uh, and additional data which we get to in a minute right but but some some data about my my identity and and if we draw this in the diagram we have a, an identity holder that owns through a private key uh, an identity a number on the blockchain and uh, and he also has an off-chain credentials vault which is usually called an identity wallet which stores private keys and some other things like credentials and we still have verifiers which are other identities and and, and issuers and they have a distrust relationship and an issuer might issue a claim on the blockchain about an identity something like a person is over 18 or is of a certain nationality uh, but that's not that common and it's not that a good so it's not the best solution in most use cases because the blockchain is a public place and we don't want everything for everyone to see the the, the another way to do it is, is to to issue these off-chain verifiable credentials which are essentially documents cryptographically signed and and they live in this off-chain credentials vault and the verifier can either verify an on-chain claim or can get temporary access to the off-chain credentials vault or the identity holder can just prove something about this data for example by a signature or zero knowledge proof right so it doesn't have to give access to this data it's enough to prove certain things uh, about this data and if we translate this into layers we get something like this right we have um, at the bottom we have decentralized identifiers which are just numbers and key public keys really that live on the blockchain on top of this we have a layer which are which is authentication um you know you 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 prove that you are a certain identity or that you control a certain identity and, and then on top of that we have credentials which are verifiable claims uh, by credential issuers that the credential verifier can use so to put this all into practice uh, and to to it only, only makes sense if everyone uses a system that is compatible with everyone else's system right otherwise it's just similar to the 
federated or, or centralized identity solution, apart from the fact that we, you know, we store everything on a blockchain, but, but we still have this, this data fragmentation and this um, fragmented ecosystem. So, so it's important to, to look at standards. And there are a number of standards emerging in different uh, contexts. The, the most important ones for, for from European perspective, uh, I've, I've listed here, but there are others in, in like an Asian or American context. But, but universally, it seems that the W3C is, is working on a number of good standards related to centralized identities and verifiable credentials. Now, Europe is working on what they call SIF, the European Self-Sovereign Identity Framework, which is still in, in development. And that's based on something called EID AS, which is a already in place regulation on digital identities in general. So standards are very useful, but they get very heavy. Um, so I don't want to go into detail of them. Uh, here is what the W3C specification of a decentralized identifier looks like, right? Uh, and don't worry about the the, the code or, or the, the code document format here on the right. Uh, there's a longer version of this talk, which I gave uh, a couple of weeks ago at the main conference that, that, that I can link to later on. We'll actually go into details and show code and show an implementation of, of this on the blockchain. Um, but, but basically, on the left here, you see something which looks a bit like a URL, and then it's, it's a similar concept, right? So you have a scheme which identifies that we are talking about decentralized identifier. Then there's something called this method, which identifies the specification we have to use to interpret this particular identifier. And then there's a, an identifier, a specific string. Um, and, and it has to, oops, sorry. It has to be um, specific enough that with a piece of software, we can translate this into a document of this type, which is a, called a DIT document. Uh, and that specifies methods of authentication, services associated with an identity, and importantly, it usually lists uh, a number of public keys. Right? So these are, are, are public keys associated with a certain identity. And obviously, the user has the private keys in their wallet. Credentials are similar, similar type of document. This is a, a, an example credential document directly from the specification. It shows a university degree, right? So there's a type, which is a, a bachelor's degree, and an issuer, which is another uh, decentralized identity, which is the university. And, and we obviously have to trust that university that issues this credential. But importantly, at the bottom here, there's a proof which is emitted in this example, but that's usually something like a digital signature or some form of zero knowledge proof. In this case, it makes sense to just be an electronic signature. And this can be used to, to, to prove someone that uh, I've in fact been issued a degree by this particular university. So that's enough about standards. Uh, let, let's look about let's look at how that can be used in, in practice. So as I said before, Signa is our platform of decentralized identity management. Um, I, I'll just use it as an example. I don't give I won't give the full introduction of the product. Um, but basically it's 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 a platform using a self sovereign identity to, to provide a number of services. And, and these services are uh, equivalent to classic use cases. So we've not implemented all of these yet, but we have implemented some of these. And the others are potential use cases that we think make sense right now using a safe sovereign identity framework um, below. The obvious one is obviously authentication, right? So once you've got an identity, you, you want to prove someone that you are this identity. Uh, I'll talk about this in detail in, in, in turn, but, um, but authentication is obviously the, 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 the most basic one. We can do things like secure data access delegation. Right? We can get, get someone temporary access to, to our data. We can do things like document timestamping, which I'll explain and actually show a demo. 
we can do things like digital signatures, uh, which leads us to the possibility of having private contracts uh, signed with different decentralized identifiers. We can issue certificates like this university certificate we've just seen. And we can even do things like electronic vote voting with our identity. And in practice, if we wanted to implement this, or well, the way we think of uh, the IDs as an implementation is that you have some form of registry, usually a smart contract on the blockchain. That's at least how we've implemented it. That has just a list of the IDs and contains public keys. And, and there's a library or some piece of software service that can resolve this to a standard compliant document. And you can work without this document, but you want a standard compliant, compliant document, the ID document, well, to be standard compliant, really. And there's something called the wallet, which holds the private keys. And each identity has a controller and a subject. Now, in a true self-sovereign identity uh, scenario, the subject and the controller are the same, right? So you want to control your own keys. The controller controls the keys, and the subject is what well, the, the subject of the identity, as the name suggests. But there are scenarios where it makes sense to have a separate controller, which is why why we we and and most other implementations and the standard itself separates the concepts of controller and subject. For example, you could have a device which is controlled by someone, right? So the, the device. Can, uh, has a controller that can, can manipulate keys. Or you can have a not so advanced user that needs help setting this up. Or, or you might even have a scenario where a user doesn't want to manage their keys and you want wants to delegate this somehow. So there are valid use cases. So if we want to use that, um, we, we the first thing, as I said, is, is obviously authentication, right? So I have an identity and I want to use this to log on somewhere. A very practical use case. And um, the standard way we do this still is by username and password, right? The, the problem with that is obviously um, we have a secret password, which we have to remember. And, and that has to be stored on a server somewhere. And uh, there's a security risk involved with this. Uh, on every login, we have to send the password, usually in clear text across the network. Uh, so we need the secure channel. We need to make sure we are, we are going through DSL or something. And, and obviously, there are clever ways to store the password securely on the server with hashes and salts and, and things like this. Um, but essentially, we still have to trust that this is run correctly on the server. And we have to trust all the employees uh, off the server because at some point that that password is clearly readable to them in the process of logging on so so it's not ideal uh, cryptographic signatures which we use in in public key infrastructures in general not just in self sovereign identity can solve this because you know what now, now we are talking about cryptography so we have to really bring bob and alice into the equation because it's tradition but if Bob sends a message to, to Alice, he can use his private key to sign this message. And, and, and Alice can use Bob's public key to verify this message. We, we, we most, well, I assume you all know that, uh, that that's how public key cryptography works. Um, and, and this is obviously a proof that, that Bob is the one signing the message. So this can be used for, by Bob to prove his identity, right? You can just send a message to Alice. Now the advantage is we don't need to store a secret password anymore. We don't need to trust the server and the communi communication channel can in theory be insecure. Now the problem with this solution is that Alice only knows that Bob has signed the message, right? This message can be reused. And if Eve, or, uh, which is usually also present in this cryptographic scenario, uh, captures this message, she can replay it, right? And she can she can imitate, uh, well, she can impersonate Bob this way. She can replay the authentication message. So fortunately, there's a solution to this. We, we have to make the message unique, right? For example, we, what we can do is can, we can add one step in the process. 
uh, where Bob has to sign a specific challenge each time that makes the message Bob signs unique. Uh, so we basically what Bob does is he says, hey, I'm Bob, I want to authenticate. And Alice said, OK, sign this uh, randomly generated message. And she sends a, a unique randomly generated message to Bob. Bob signs this and sends it back. So in this case, we, the message is unique. And, and if, she, if Alice were to receive um, an earlier message captured by Eve in reply to this, she, she would know that you know, that's not the one I wanted to send. So I don't let Bob log on on this occasion. So that works very well for most use cases, and and it's it's used starting to be used quite a lot, and 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 it works well, and and we've implemented it, and and, and it's useful, uh, but it's not perfect. So the, the, there's one problem, and that's if the message, they said the communication channel doesn't have to be secure, so that means that Eve can can read the message, um, and. and Eve can just use Bob's public key to resolve the signature, and then she knows that Bob has interacted with Alice. So there's some privacy that has leaked. It doesn't allow Eve to log on, but she knows Bob has logged on at a certain time. And that's not ideal. At least for some use cases, it's not ideal. What we really want is something like this, right? Bob wants to log on and, and then uh, Alice issues a challenge. But this challenge has to be done in a way that it cannot be traced to Bob. Bob computes some knowledge of some private information and sends proof based on this challenge back to Alice that can also not be traced back to Bob. And then there's some public information, for example, on a blockchain about Bob that Alice can use to verify that this proof really relates to the private piece of information, like a secret password uh, that Bob knows. So Bob essentially proves knowledge of uh, a secret of a password uh, to Alice without giving anything away. Uh, and, and there's no tracing back of who's interacted with whom. And, and that's really a zero knowledge proof, right? So a zero knowledge proof are a subject which I, you know, we, we could do a, a number of seminars on, so I won't go into detail at all. Uh, it, it's enough to say here that uh, this works, and, and it's actually not that difficult to do. It turns out a number of signature schemes, so for example, SNOS signatures, support this property, and if, if they're used in a certain way. And the math uh, involved is actually not that complicated. Uh, but, but it's quite clever, but you know, it's, it's, if anyone is interested and wants to read up on it, it it's, it's quite easy to understand. Um, so usually when I do more technical longer talk on this, I, 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 I make a demo because we've implemented this, uh, both the zero knowledge justification and the, the you know, with our did the ID scheme and the, 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 the classic signature-based identification, but but it, it's not very exciting if I don't show any code, right? So when I show code, I can show how to implement this, and it's quite interesting for for very technically minded people. Uh, but if I just want to show it here, it, it's just a simple button that says "log on," and then it says "Hooray, you are authenticated." So it's not it's not very uh, exciting, and could be done in a number of ways below. So I'm not going to show it. But if anyone is interested, the longer version of the talk actually shows some, some code. Again, I have a link to it. So moving on, the next use case I want to talk about is document timestamping, right? which is often described as low-hanging fruit in, in blockchain technology. Uh, low-hanging fruit because it's relatively easy to implement in an obvious use case, but we don't really see it used that often. So. But we, we've done it anyway, right? If it's easy, it doesn't mean we don't have to do it. Um, that's actually surprisingly difficult to do it properly. <laughs> but but uh, anyway, um, document timestamping is really the notarization of a document or some piece of data by storing a cryptographic fingerprint of that data on the blockchain. So essentially storing a hash of some data on the blockchain. And that can be used to, uh, to prove the existence of an exact version of a document at a certain time. So I send the hash to the blockchain, uh, 
and and this hash by being included in the blockchain is time stamped by the miner so there's a moment in time where this is included in a block and i can always prove that the same hash that a new document that sorry that a, a version of the document that restores to the same hash is the original document and was bread was in that version at a certain time and the, the 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 interesting part of this is that you don't actually have to send the data to the blockchain you just send the hash and, and you can use it for a number of things like protecting your registering your IPR um, to prove the authenticity authenticity of documents or any data in general you can do private contracts so, so it is, it's actually quite useful and I'll, I'll show a quick demonstration of this so this is just a, a demo we've implemented there's a smart contract on the blockchain it's on the ring B test network now so if i connect to this network my address is now connected on the ring B test network it's all on ethereum right but it could be on a number of blockchains and and i can notarize the document so i go here and i can just load a file for example these amazing GoPro videos I've got here. And then I can do one more step here. I can actually sign a message. So MetaMask now opens up. It asks me to sign a message, which is just the hash. And I sign this. So I've, my browser, or, or well, the JavaScript in my browser has now calculated the hash of the file and has signed a message. And I can use that to store it on the blockchain. And then I actually have to confirm a transaction. And, and now, obviously, I'm interacting with a real blockchain. So it's going to take a while. But in a few seconds, hopefully, this block will be mined, or this, this transaction will be included in a block. And it always takes longer in a, in a demo than when I try it. But now it's done it, right? So I now have a transaction hash and, and well, some, some information which is not important. But I can go back here and I can verify a document. So I browse, I think it was the second one I used. So this calculates the hash again, also it doesn't show it here. And I can just read from the blockchain, which is instantaneous. And, and I see that. Um, there's a signature uh, which has been resolved to this address, which is my address, right, related to my identity. And it was uh, assigned on the 10th of March. Um, really, we could include the time as well, because the timestamp is just a number of seconds, but since 1970. But, you know, it, it will still say March the 10th, 2021, in five years' time. If I, if I want to verify this same video. So I can prove that I had this video file on my system at this date in exactly this, this form. And that, that's obviously quite useful. And, and note that you know we've, we've loaded files and calculated hashes in the browser, but we didn't send any of this data to the blockchain, right? It did not, nothing left my system. Um, so let's just go back to the presentation. So if you want to take this a step further, we can do things like uh, private signatures. And, uh, you know, private signatures, well, pri sorry, private contracts, right? So, so we, we, we can have something like DocuSign, which you've probably all used before, but, but in a trustless way without having to trust the company called DocuSign. Uh, we can use our digital identities to sign documents and uh, we can have a user interface that allows us to create and sign private contracts between two different uh, identities. And if we combine this with document timestamping, we, we, we can have something like document, like DocuSign that stores hashes of our contracts on the blockchain. So we don't have to trust DocuSign that the, you know, that the, the, the version is the same. And, um, Again, no contract details have to go to the blockchain. It's all 
that's all off chain. Similar example is issuing these certificates. There we actually start using verifiable credentials, but we're still signing data, right? We're signing a, a piece of information that someone has um, a certain credential, like a university certificate or is able to drive a car and things like this. And the example is obvious, the, the advantage is obvious, right? So it's it's verifiable by anyone, it's it's in real time, it reduces uh, certificate fraud and, and there's a cost reduction involved. Next use case is a bit more complex, right? We can have secure data access delegation and um, that's just a, a very basic diagram of this. We have some piece of encrypted data on, on the blockchain and then we have an access registry that is public. And in that object access registry, what we actually store is um, an encrypted version of the key uh, that, that is uh, used to encrypt this data. So the key is encrypted again, but it's encrypted again with the public key of the identity we want to, to, to allow access. And if we want to revoke this access, we just remove this. Now, now, obviously, that, that that's like with all things. Once you've given access, you can revoke access. But if someone has made a copy of the data, then that, that, that's it. it. It's got it. But uh, that, that that's unavoidable in, in in any data access delegation scenario. Um, it's actually a bit more complicated because the ecliptic curve cryptography we use requires us to do some tricks because it cannot be used to directly encrypt data, even as small as, uh, as another encryption key. Uh, but there are things like ECIES, which I think is elliptic curve integrated uh, encryption scheme, uh, which which exploits it, well, which uses a Diffie-Hellman agreement to uh, to simulate uh, encryption or, or provide encryption using public keys. But 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 anyway, I, I don't want to the details of this, but but we can actually provide a secure access delegation using the same type of keys used in, in decentralized identities. Now, the next thing we can do is to implement e-voting, right? Well, uh, great. Well, um, e-voting is a great use case um, for blockchains in general, but it's also much more complex than it at first seems. Right? So basically, we are now combining identities with verifiable credentials, you know, like you're allowed to vote in a certain country or in a certain situation, in a certain context. And, and then we have a number of voting smart contracts. Though the obvious advantage of this is self-telling and auditable. So there's a, we don't have to trust the person that makes the voting machine. Anyone can audit this. Um, the difficulty is to do it privately preserving. There are ways of doing it and our GitHub, there's some very simple voting examples and we're still working on a more general solution. But but it's it's a complex subject. But in principle, decentralized identities can be used for uh, this type of, of electronic voting in a secure way. So that, that's almost it. Uh, before before I want to finish, I just want to explain a little bit how Signal is structured um, in terms of what what is public and what is not and what it uses. So right now we're using Ethereum-based smart contracts, but, but they're extremely light smart contracts and could be, we could really use any blockchain for this. So the blockchain level is, is fairly flexible. And then we have the standard compliant protocol, uh, which is open source and public, uh, and the number of libraries to use that. Uh, right now, things that are on our GitHub are fairly alpha version. But the, the, and some of it is not open source yet because we're still working on it. But all the protocol level will be open source. And then on top of this, there'll be a number of APIs which can be used uh, to build a number of services. And we will obviously plan in the future to offer certain services. Um, but again, I don't want to go too much into the product here. And it's still work in progress anyway. So as I said, there, there's... Um, a longer version of this talk available with some code examples and it's more technical. Maybe Sylvia can paste the link into the chat uh, or, or I'll do it uh, quick afterwards. Um, but it's um, 
yeah, here is the, the, the web page of Signo, which doesn't have much information on, but it's there. Uh, our company website and my information to contact me on Twitter. And that's about it. Uh, I'll open the floor for questions, I suppose. I'm just looking at the chat. There's not much activity, so no questions there. Yeah, guys, go ahead. If you have any questions, I'm just looking for the link for the workshop. I will post it now. One second. Okay, someone asked if, if they can have a copy of this presentation. Yes, uh, the recording will be available and the slides as well. So I just posted the link. And Miguel asked if there's a limit on the file size to be signed in the browser. Um, I, I don't think so, that, 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 to be honest. Uh, to be honest, I don't know the, the, the entirely correct answer. The file I signed before was a very heavy video file. And uh, the, the obvious uh, limitation is whatever your uh, JavaScript interpreter can, can uh, can deal with and the library we use for um, for calculating the hash. So in principle, there's no limit. Um, in practice, there might be implementation limits. Uh, I don't think there are any very practical limits. Uh, that fair, you know, on a, on a modern system, but but I'm not sure. Okay, someone is asking, how can one use this to build their own app? Well, uh, uh, some of this is already on our, our GitHub. It, it, it's not there. So there's n it's a number of libraries and a number of, of smart contracts. And, and anyone can use that. It's open source, MIT licensed. Uh, other stuff is not released yet. So, so you'll have to, to wait. But, uh, and, and it's also very early uh, work in progress. So it's, it's, our, at least our implementation, there are others, right? So our implementation is alpha and, and it's work in progress. So there's not any great documentation, yet, uh, but there will be in the future. So, so anyone can use the open source part to build. And once we have any APIs defined, uh, people could also interact with the APIs, I suppose, but that's still to be decided. So someone asked what type of verifiable credential do you use? Just JSON ID. Uh, yes, we, we for, for now we use JSON verifiable credentials. Um, it's still work in progress, so we might extend this at some point. But, but for now it's all JSON based, just the, the very basic version in, 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 in the W3C verifiable credential standards. And, and obviously we haven't implemented the whole, the whole standard. Um, how does this compare to something like open timestamp? Uh, the, the document signing is essentially very similar to opentimestamps.org. It, it does, I suppose it, well, uh, if, if open timestamp is the service I'm thinking of, there are several, uh, then, um, then it's essentially the same. There's a small difference that we, we are also signing the data with uh, an identity's private key. Now that's useful when you have several keys associated with a, a single identity, so you could use a number of them to sign. But, but essentially, that's the same thing. So someone says, how on earth are we going to get mass adoption if DAPs are just complex? Um, well, yeah. It, it, that, that, that's obviously a problem, UX, uh, user experience with, with DAPs. It, it's complex because it's been built, in, in, <laughs> and this usually happens, it's complex because it's been built by by technical people for technical, to show to technical people, and it's just a demo. Um, obviously, we, we can build the very same thing where, 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 where it's a little bit easier, but but there, there's a general problem with, which I don't want to go into with too much detail, but there's a general usability problem we all know uh, with decentralized applications that, that, that there's essentially a, a technical barrier to entry. 
And right now, it's a good thing that it exists because we don't want anyone just to fiddle with private keys and do stuff and then lose them, right? So it's a, that's my opinion, at least. Essentially, we want this to be to make this secure and safe and easy to use for everyone. But it's not just enough to make it easy to use, uh, and then people get themselves into a mess when they lose their access to their private keys. So right now, it's a good thing that users have to know what they're doing. But but obviously. If we wanted to use something like document timestamping as a as an enterprise service, you know, we could just mm, abstract all the signing away from the user if we wanted to. What are the best related learning resources? Uh, okay, so that that's uh, to learn about decentralized identity in general. There, there are a number of interesting blogs. There's actually uh, an SSI meetup. I think if you if you search for SSI Meetup, uh, you you find the page with a number of very interesting talks uh, that have been recorded over the last few years by, by very clever people that work on self sovereign identity. The standards page, or you know, go to the W three C web page and look for the DID standards. Is the more heavy, harder to read uh, resource, but that's interesting as well. And and yeah, obviously there are a number of blogs and 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 things that you can look at. Uh, any idea of time frame with your team? So yeah, time frame uh, for developing this. Uh, but I mean, the, the first use cases are, are imminent, and then we build on this over the next years. We, we've just obtained funding for three years, so it's it's, it's going to be a long term project. Okay, thank you for inviting me and thank you everyone for listening. Okay.